finished surfaces are going up. Inspector rolls up and says, boom, stop work notice, throws off the entire schedule. Finished surfaces, drywall has to be taken back down. Hey, this is Joel Walsman, CEO and Master Electrician of Jefferson Electric. Today, we are in our new facility that sits behind HQ. This facility is 2,400 square feet that is being deemed off-grid. It is the HQ for our new off-grid division. We anticipate doing a half million dollars year one in this building with off-grid renewable energy systems, solar energy and battery tied, potentially with generator integration for travel vans, RVs, cabins, sailboats, boat docks, boat houses, things of that nature where it's too hard or too hard to get power or the customer doesn't want grid connection. That's what this building's for. Check the step-by-step -step videos that we'll be posting. Look for the link on how to wire this up. But today I wanted to bring a couple examples and explanations around permitting a commercial structure. A commercial structure like this will be permitted on a couple different bases. Base number one, planning and zoning. The Planning and Zoning Commission are going to have a say about how this property can be properly utilized and that's going to partially define its intended uses, what it's capable of being used for, and what it's not capable of being used for. Occupancy fits into that category. And occupancy is actually going to be the single largest determination of how this building gets permitted and wired. See, in the National Electrical Code, you've got specific occupancies that each have their own article. An article is like a chapter of the code, if you will, but in this case, the code has nine chapters, and then within chapters, there are subchapters called articles, and that's where you're going to look for the specific occupancy that's going to fill this space. So planning and zoning will determine allowable occupancies. The occupancy that's specific will then determine um, the building and structure type and materials that have been utilized, not just for the structure, but also for the wiring. So you, you condense all that down to a specific situation, and now you have a, a, a viable permit application within the context of building, planning, and zoning. So probably best bet is to get on the phone with your local inspector, go to your planning and permitting department, talk through, if you're not sure, talk through the intended use of the building and make sure all of those dominoes line up and are ready to fall. <laughs> Quick story, my wife and I purchased an 11,000 square foot mixed use commercial building. It had been nothing but storage for probably over 30 years at the time we bought it. It was dilapidated, it was run down. I started pulling the things together to get this ship moving and sailing across the ocean. And I was so naive as to tell contractors that I was coordinating with, because I, I know a lot of guys in the trades, right? I've got plumbers and carpenters and I rub shoulders with these guys every day. And I was telling them, yeah, you know, we're starting permitting now, we're getting through the process, and we'll probably be ready to rock in about six to eight weeks. That was a total joke. See, one thing I didn't realize was storage is a use and an occupancy of a building. So when we went to create a coffee shop, co-work studio, event space with tenant occupancy in that 11,000 square feet as well, that was considered a change of use. A change of use required us, to uh, prevented us rather, from being grandfathered in to any existing uh, standards and required us to bring the building current to the latest standards. This is a three-story building. So for instance, uh, I didn't know when we bought the building that we were going to be required to have an elevator. There was not an elevator in that building. He also didn't know that we we're going to be required to have a second means of egress off the th second and third floor for fire escape because it's an event space. So now it's an assembly occupancy, a type A, maybe A1 assembly occupancy if I uh, re remember correctly. So the architect says to me, he says, you know you're gonna have to have an elevator, right? I'm like, oh no, I just hear expensive. Like that's what he said to me. And so I'm like, no, I didn't know that. And he says, you know what they cost, right? I'm like, no, I have no idea. 
He's like $85,000. So uh, that's not even the whole story there. <laughs> it gets better. $85,000 is the, is the cab that passengers ride in and the hydraulic pump that moves the liquids. That's what 85, that's what he meant by an elevator. What he didn't tell me was that elevator is gonna need to have a fa engineering, a foundation, a shaft, electrical wiring, a roof, insulation, firepro fireproofing, permitting, approvals, planning review. It's not an $85,000 elevator. It's a $145,000 elevator, and that was the cheapest way we could do it. Instead of carving out the inside of the building and messing up the floor plan, we built an external shaft on the outside of the building. So what I'm driving at here is planning, zoning, use, occupancy, grandfathering clauses, all of these things come into play and affect how a building is permitted. Commercial permits take at least 30 days. And get this, if you have a structure that's above a certain cubic volume, or a four family dwelling or above, I'm, not a, I'm, not a, I'm getting into architectural stuff here, this is not electrician stuff, but I just need you to have some awareness around it. It's there's a cubic volume, and there's a, a dwelling occupancy count, like number of occupancies, and anything larger than that actually has to go to the Department of Homeland Security to get approved before the permit can be released. So you're not in it for 30 days for the permit, you're in it for another 30 days. If there are no COVID lockdowns and shutdowns, you're in it for another 30 days for Homeland Security review, and every time you bounce back and forth, let, let's say you get permitted through one, you know, Homeland Security says, boom, good to go. You now get into local planning review, you hit a snag, you have to rework, you go back to the architect, he's got a schedule, he comes back to you, you've got costs to consider around what he's proposing, you go to your subs, you chat things through, you come up with a value engineered plan because architects do not live in the real world, I'm telling you. You go back to the architect for his kind of global, visionary, comprehensive understanding of what's taking place. So you ping pong back and forth there. Then you gotta go back to the Department of Homeland Security to get approval. Before you come back to permitting and plan review, it's not 30 days, it's not 60 days, it's 180 days, guys. <laughs> Six months. I was totally off on my projection. I thought I was padding the situation because I had no idea in a metropolitan municipal jurisdiction what's involved in permitting a commercial structure. It could be easy breezy. If you've got a small structure, you've got a limited scope of work, you're just wiring up something that's existing. It's not a change of use. You could be in and out with a permit in a small jurisdiction for a town or a, or a village, same day. That's best case scenario. But I've experienced six months and a lot of my customers have experienced the same thing in larger cities like Indianapolis where the population's over a million and the process is substantial for commercial permitting. So there's, there's insight number one. Don't get caught unaware when you're purchasing, renting, building out a commercial structure. All right, so now we have our permits. What's next? We need to be aware of at least three types of inspections. There could be more, and let me walk you through those. Inspection number one, probably the first thing you'll encounter is the under slab inspection. Now that only comes into play if there is conduit and wiring that's being installed under slab or in ground. Um, for most jurisdictions, when you open a trench and bury a line or a conduit, that's gonna need to be inspected before you close it back up. Um, that's also consistent with under slab. So let's say you've got floor outlets, in our case, or potentially the electrical service is not gonna be mounted to the outside of the structure. That main electrical panel, it's gonna be on an interior wall. You may have under slab wiring, PVC conduit, that's buried in the pea gravel and then comes up inside the structure. That's gotta get inspected before concrete is poured. In our jurisdiction, those inspection turnaround timeframes are two hours. And when that time frame expires, if that's not been inspected, then you've got the right to proceed with construction. A rough-in inspection would be inspection number two, and that's got a 48 hour turnaround time frame. That's a, a larger time frame. And what the rough-in inspection is, is everything completely wired before any finished materials are installed. So rough-in inspection, people get turned around on this all the time. 
um, do-it-yourselfers or homeowners who are just trying to accelerate a little bit, inspectors get real dicey, real salty, and real difficult to work with. When finished materials start to go up before that inspection is complete, most jurisdictions will consider that the single most important inspection, the rough inspection, because that is when the inspector wants to lay eyes on the whole project and confirm the quality of wiring, the size of the wire, the locations and destinations according to code for how things are wired, um, life safety, like exit signs, emergency lighting, receptacles to code, things of that nature. Let me demystify one thing here real quick. A commercial shop like this is not bound by the code requirements of dwelling units. So in a dwelling unit, you're required to have an outlet within six feet of wall space that's not the case in this shop. In this shop, we could get away with one receptacle outlet and not one every 12 feet along the wall. So you've got to understand it's different. But the rough inspection still applies and is critical. If you get off on the wrong foot with an inspector at the get-go, he will give you difficulty the entirety of the project. You've got to proactively reach out to the inspector, bring him in as your friend, your accomplice, your cohort, Win him over, don't bribe him, but win him over, listen to his lectures. I'm a younger guy and I've always, I'm, at this point, I'm 34 years old, right? I was doing this when I was 22 years old. And so inspector walks onto site, a lot of times those guys are 40s, 50s, and 60s, right? And so I always get a lecture. Even if there's nothing wrong, he's just imparting the knowledge he has. And I tell you what, it's been valuable. Sit there, nod and listen and just soak it in and when by the time he's done giving you a 35 minute lecture about his you know career as a union carpenter or whatever he's done in the past he glances around he's like seems pretty good passes the inspection and he's out of there just you just gotta be friends right so then finally you have a final inspection the final inspection is when everything is complete if you've got a light fixture that's back ordered and so you've got an open electrical junction box in the ceiling and it's not covered, that could cause you to fail a final inspection just like I've done in the past. It's like, well, there's gonna be a light there and the inspector of course says, how do I know that, right? You've gotta put a blank on it, you've gotta put a temporary light in it, you've gotta satisfy the requirements of the code and demonstrate that everything is final and safe in order to pass your final inspection. In our jurisdiction, a final inspection is triggered by sending in what's called a completion card. You don't use the phone, it's all online. You send in a completion card and then that triggers a final inspection and the inspector has up to one year to show up unannounced to inspect that property. Isn't that crazy? One year. I've had inspectors show up 51 weeks later and say, it's time for your final inspection. You're like, what? <laughs> The, the customer, the homeowner is like, I had no idea that this was even possible. You know, I failed to communicate to them. And we're kind of all frustrated. He shows up unannounced. For, they're living in the house. Their kids ever. One year. So understand the, the benchmark inspections. Understand the time frames associated with them. Stay on track with your inspector because you get sideways and he has a lot of latitude to make your life difficult. Because ultimately the National Electrical Code it's not the enforcement. It's the standard, but it's not the enforcement. And the difference here is, you may have satisfied all the requirements of the code, but the inspector has the authority to bring in his own interpretation of those codes and standards, and he can really throw off your plan if you get sideways by calling for a higher standard, calling for more expense, calling for rework. So keep it dialed in with the inspector. Historical perspective. Now, eight to ten years ago in uh, Indianapolis, it was kind of like the wild, wild west. The inspectors were not held to a high standard. They would do these drive-by inspections where literally they'd pull up in front of the house, they'd enter the permit information, they'd click pass, they might walk through the front door, kind of shine a flashlight around, be like, eh get back in their truck, sit in their truck for an hour or two, and then move on to the next inspection. It was really, really sloppy. Now inspectors in our jurisdiction are required GPS located at a job site for a minimum specif specification of time. I don't know how that works exactly, but they are required to be at jobs for rough inspections for minimum duration. And so the enforcement has increased. Along with that, 
the city of Indianapolis increased their permitting costs substantially and doubled their inspector base. That means that there's much tighter parameters around inspections and enforcement. Contractors weren't ready for that when it happened and there was a lot of kind of sloppy work that was being done and I'm gonna, I'm gonna advocate for inspectors here real quick because it definitely elevated the common standard across the board. It was a good thing. If you choose not to permit your project at this point in our jurisdiction, you're warring against reality and it just gets ugly because see people move along with shoddy work, the project is 50% in, finished surfaces are going up, inspector rolls up and says, boom, stop work notice, throws off the entire schedule, finished surfaces, drywall has to be taken back down for rough inspections, budgets get thrown off, contractors and homeowners get into clashes with each other, whose fault is this, who's pulling the permit, you said you didn't want a permit, but you should have done it right anyways. Like it got, it, I've seen it get pretty ugly a couple of times, being a subcontractor and looking at the, the altercation between a homeowner and a general contractor. So don't war against reality, pull your permits. I think that's uh, definitely the, the high road and you'll develop the reputation that you want. So ultimately, inspectors are your friends. If you think about the certainty of turning on any light switch in the United States of America and having a pretty high level of confidence about survival, <laughs> that's a blessing in contrast to foreign countries without codes and enforcements and standards. Inspectors are your friends. <sighs> Enough about that, let's wire up the shop. I'm gonna show you step by step, click here for the next video, and subscribe to Electric Pro Academy for real skills to make real money.